when i got a mail from venkat srinivasan uh, regarding a talk on archives opening i thought well uh, what i will do with this archive opening you know because my role is entirely different from something uh, uh, related with science or you know in the archives my role over here is actually hospitality uh, services which includes uh, canteen guest house hostel housekeeping security sort of things so i was wondering you know i mean how to give a talk on this so then immediately i saw one more uh, line added with that mail saying that you know i mean that is just you know to reflect how do you enter in tafr and then to mcbs so good fine you know when uh, so that's not a problem you know so uh, i need not to take any tension on that you know i mean science or something so good uh, so i'll talk about you know i mean my entry into tafr at mumbai i had uh, joined at tfr may 1984 21st may 1984 my entry into tfr is something you know i mean different uh, because uh, i was a student at tfr in institute for hotel management and catering technology at carroll road uh, mumbai dadar uh, we students used to gather talk about the industry uh, the hotel industry so the hotel industry is so wide you know i mean people always uh, hear about you know i mean only taj i mean obroy president at that time but um, uh, when we went to college you know when we came to know a lot of things about this hotel industry that is in institutional, institutional catering offshore catering commercial catering etc etc so of course you know when i when i was uh, on camp during campus interview i have been selected in hotels uh, i continue my service over there i continued and you know uh, we that students meet together and we used to discuss about this institutional in, institutional catering so that time you know the uh, mr sahayan said you know i mean advertisement used to come newspaper only not through your online or something like that. so when we saw an and i saw an advertisement regarding this you know when catering super is written tfr i thought yeah, well you know why don't i um, apply for it so i applied i had uh, gone through the interview selection committee meeting everything and then finally i got selected well i joined there and i entered first day in tfr to our office canteen there i saw a huge place in the basement which has got lot of uh, big equipments hot plates very big vessels which which Uh, people two to three three people used to carry and keep it on the i mean empty vessels i am talking about i said oh i joined in a wrong place you know i mean how come you know i mean uh, i can continue over here of course you know i mean when i look at the people again i got some sort of sweating the thing is that at the time of my joining i was just 22 and the people those were all you know i mean 35 40 50 55 so it was a i mean of course it was a challenge you know then uh, there are uh, different things over there you know i mean uh, the um, the labor union that is you know saniya saniya lokadhikari samiti tfr for employees union all sort of issues you know i mean when i started work i said you know i mean of course you know i mean i left run away from here but somehow you know i mean i continued for 10 years so at that time you know um, again uh, my boss said that you know i mean then the boss said uh, look you know i mean there is an opportunity at ncbs bangalore why don't you apply for it i said okay well you know when it is close to my native place why don't i try so i just tried and uh, of course uh, mr sahadevan was there in that uh, committee interview committee and plus uh, i mean matthew vijayaragan etc but i got selected when i came over here you know i mean they had assigned me a place where you know it is only 15 by 20 length kitchen and i saw the room and what is this you know i mean where i had landed you know i mean again trouble <laughs> so i was remembering my i mean uh, canteen committee chairman over there he was telling that you know usually people go from big place to the next biggest place this fellow is going to a small place why are you going to do this you know 
This is a small center. NCBC is a small center. They are going to set up only, you know, I mean, there are hardly five, six people. Where are you going? I said, no, it's uh, close to my place. You know, that's why I'm taking this opportunity. And also, you know, I mean, in this place, CIFR, I will have to be uh, up to the retirement, you know, the same position. So, of course, I thought, you know, I mean, I'll take this opportunity and go. So, I have come over here and, you know, I mean, I took this opportunity. Then I found that, you know, I mean, of course, you know, this is a growing thing, you know, I mean, and of course, you know, Professor Siddiqui was one of the uh, instrumental person for me to shift over here. Because in the middle of the shifting, you know, I mean, I had a plan to go back again. So, Professor Siddiqui insisted me to go join at TNCBS Bangalore and see that, you know, how it happens. So, I had come over here and continued and from that 1520 to now it is 2,000 square feet kitchen plus dining hall plus 40 acres of land here in this campus, 10 acres of land at the other places. So it's a huge place which I'm managing with canteen, guest house, hostel, security, housekeeping, etc., etc. So this is a wonderful thing, you know, when for my past years of service, I thank you very much to all of you. Thank you, Mr. Vakis. And we'll um, wrap up these reflections with um, a reflection by um, a scientist at NCPS and a former student, Deepthi Trivedi. Um, again, a name that's probably familiar to a lot of you, at least half of you. Um, what Deepthi doesn't know yet is that I have actually seen all her sort of starting letters, you know, letters of inquiry to obey. And she probably doesn't want to know what she wrote in those. Um, good fun, man. Um, so, Deepthi, I think you also have a slide which I'll uh, yeah. jump to. So I'll be quick in interest of time because 4.30 is what I have been told to student. Um, so I'm going to talk about what, uh, so 99 I joined NCBS when, when uh, NCBS moved to this campus and I had moved to this campus, uh, I mean I had joined this campus. My daughter re recently asked me, have you ever seen dinosaurs live? And I said, I'm not that old and she asked me, what about Nani, has she seen them? So, but very close. We were, I will talk about uh, where Shaju left, about hunters and gatherers, because that's exactly what we were. Constantly worry of worrying about where our next food is coming from, because the canteen was open only five hours a day, and that to one hour each time. And this campus was nowhere. Uh, there was the closest place where one could eat was actually at the Bellary Road, where there were some dhabas. And um, so we had to walk there. Otherwise, the best place to eat was IASC still. So at 11.30 at night, everybody would get into these um, uh, Mazda shuttles and go to, um, uh, to the coffee boat to eat our idli at night, come back by 12.30 shuttle, and then we would uh, continue our work. Um, so this is exactly what we were constantly talking to each other, where we are eating, uh, on Sunday evenings, where we are uh, getting our food. I mean, science would go on, but food was very important component in the beginning of that <laughs> of those years because we really didn't know where that food is coming from. So, thank you. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you all for doing this. Um, I kind of put you on a spot, but um, I did this for a reason. Um, to ask this uh, question that I've been asking myself uh, since the last two years that I've been, a little over two years, uh, this question of where does the archive begin? Where does, where does the story begin? Where does it end? Where does it reside? And I think it's useful for us to realize that what you heard right now is very much in the past, it's in the present, and in the future. Um, in terms of the reflections are being from the past, but they are recounted in the present, they're a reflection um, that are informed by their feelings today, which are different from how they were 10 years ago. They'll be different 10 years hence. And so the, the archive is a living, breathing thing. Um, and the stories in the archives always feed each other. And that's what we hope the archives at NCBS can do going forward. Um, I've walked through a little bit of this. I'll, I'll come back to this towards the end. But um, I just want to sort of uh, give some broad overviews of what we're trying to do here. Um, first. Show of hands if you're tired of hearing me say this. Um, but it's true. We truly believe this. Archives enable diverse stories. There's really no other way for me to think about how we think about the 
the material that goes into the archive, how we describe it, how we make it accessible. Uh, the means to the end is, of course, preserving historical material, but this is the end, that we're looking for an en enabling diver a diversity of stories. Um, the archives eliminate context and process, of course. Um, and when, when we say the word stories, you know, uh, there's a very broad sense of this word. You know, we're not just talking about the stories that you think of, but grant proposals, research ideas. We've had so many students in the last couple of weeks come to the archives, um, have a look at some of the material, and I hope um, all of you keep coming in especially if you're a student of science. Uh, we don't have enough people from uh, the scientific community come into an archive, and I hope that changes going forward. So uh, in terms of uh, more practical structures around the boundary conditions of the archive, uh, the archive at NCBS, the archive at NCBS um, aims to be a center for the contemporary history, I mean, sorry, history of contemporary biology in India. Um, these three words are also chosen slightly carefully. Contemporary is our sense of looking at time. Um, India broadly or South Asia looking at space and biology in terms of the discipline or the, the, the thematic ways in which we look at it. It is a thematic archive. It is not an institutional archive. Um, at this point, however, of course, most of our material is institutional. But going forward, we hope that more than half of the material is from the public. Um, to do that, we need your trust. And we hope we can do whatever it takes to gain your trust. Uh, we'll show you these spaces, just a couple of glimpses of the, the archive. Uh, the photographs are taken by Ravi, who's standing here right now. And um, I will constantly annoy you about this. Um, when we, uh, we really hope you can spread the word. We have a couple of postcards when you are at the archives. Uh, please do take them, send them. We have stamps, we have a post box, um, we have glue, we have paper, we have ink. You need an address, all right? Shouldn't take too much. Um, and I think some of these postcards have actually reached, so the postal system works, right? So, uh, oh, good. Right. So, uh, what, we, what we're launching today is the beginning of an archive, right? And um, this is, as I said, it's looking at the, as a center for the history of contemporary biology. We've launched a physical archival space, um, and there's a digital narrative space that I can show you just now. There are, these are the other things that we're doing as we go forward. Um, by the end of this year, we hope that we can offer to the public um, a platform to tell or find and tell different kinds of narratives using the same archival objects. We want the public to realize that um, there are stories embedded in every object, and we want people to realize that no matter what your age is, you can come up with these stories, and that depends on how you look at the material. Um, by early 2020, this is all sort of leading up to a larger goal, which is mentioned towards the end. Um, we want people to realize that there are multiple ways of looking at every object. We're trying to build a tool for people to sort of have these uh, dynamic annotations of archival objects. Um, and all this is sort of going back to that first aim that I'd mentioned, enabling a diversity of stories, that we want a certain diversity of thoughts and descriptions around these objects. The archive cannot exist um, in, in a robust way, but it's only being described by the archivist. It needs your input, it needs your challenges, it needs you guys to refute the things that we sort of take for granted. Um, and finally, we're sort of trying to work towards this uh, la larger goal of trying to set up an interconnected digital archive of science. If any of you are from other science institutions, please come talk to us. Uh, we'd love to sort of see if we can collaborate with you. And uh, we hope to have this uh, sort of functional sometime in mid-2020. Um, and it, uh, that is when we think we'll have that starting up. It'll take many years for it to sort of really sort of uh, settle and go forward. I was having a chat with Sanjeev earlier today, and I was just realizing the, the, the sheer range of possibilities that exist if we start to collaborate uh, amongst all these institutions. So I really look forward to talking to all of you who are from other institutions. And um, just a couple of quick notes before I hand it off to Jeetu. Um, this archive uh, that we're, we've been building over the last couple of years is, is a team effort. There have been over 40 people involved in this work. Um, I, I cannot tell you how grateful I am to these people, especially the students who have been working with us. Many of them in the audience right now, they, they raise their hands. And I'm, I'm truly grateful for the effort they've put in, and I hope this has been slightly interesting to them. Um, so thank you, guys. Um, and on behalf of our old team, um, I really want to thank um, the families of Obeid Siddiqui, K.S. Krishnan, and Ravi Shankaran. I believe the families of uh, um, Obeid Siddiqui and Ravi Shankaran are the audience right now. Um, the, uh, the archive relies on trust. It cannot do anything without you donating material. So we're hoping that there'll be other members of the public who can sort of, um, uh, who feel like they can trust the archive and give material to an archive. Um, we promise to take care of it. Uh, I want to thank the teams at NCBS. Um, this, this is an extraordinary group of people. Uh, we take a lot of things for granted, but as you go to the archive, you'll realize how much effort each of these groups has put in, the, the civil group, the electrical group, 
um, every small thing has been sort of taken care of by these guys, and I'm sort of very, very grateful that they've sort of come at every point that we've asked things. Uh, probably put a ton of tickets in the system, so I might have tested that system to no end. So uh, if someone has statistics on that, I'd, be, I'd like to know. Um, I want to thank, um, these are groups that, again, um, the, the archival community in India is sort of this wild west phenomenon. Nobody really speaks to each other, but I'm hoping we can change this. Um, and uh, I'm really grateful to these collaborating institutions that we have worked with. Each of them has contributed something to this archive in terms of thought, in terms of material. The San Francisco Public Library shipped us a box of conservation goods um, you know, a couple of months ago. It's just so nice to sort of see the generosity amongst these uh, communities. You know, some of them just shared their entire working flow. So we had our job actually relatively easy. We just sort of copy pasted a lot of these things. We followed best practices. We knew what to look for, what to avoid. And we're in touch with all these groups and we're hoping that we can sort of going forward give back to this community in some meaningful way. And uh, I don't know how to say this. I mean, there's just been a whole lot of the, I mean, the people that you're seeing here are not, are not all archivists or conservators. They're just people who've been thinking deeply about these fields. And a lot of them um, have just been very instrumental in the way they've um, uh, sort of shaping our thinking of what the archive could be, what it should do. And uh, I'm, I'm really thankful to this group of people. So um, with that, I want to hand it off to, uh, to Jeetal uh, to tell us a little bit about the history uh, and the motivation for setting up the archives at NCBS. Jeetal. Well, uh, thanks, Venkit. Uh, I wasn't sure that we were going to get to this date, but, but here we are. And, uh, <laughs> and it's really fantastic that, uh, that, that we are celebrating the opening of this archive. Um, <clears throat> well, I, um, I, I should say that when NCBS turned 25, uh, we, and we were celebrating this occasion, uh, it was also tinged with uh, sort of great sadness for many of us that Obeid wasn't around to share that moment. Um, Obeid, for those of you who did not know him, um, or perhaps those of you are, are much closer, was um, the founder of NCBS and an unbelievable fount of archival material. Um, he, from what I gather, kept every note that he wrote, every scribble that he felt was important. And um, he also brought me to realize at that point that if you were ever to understand individuals uh, and their motivations, institutions and their, and their directions, uh, we needed a place where we could reflect on these uh, articles of history. And, um, and it was you know, certainly my uh, you know, deepest uh, uh, desire at that time uh, that we build something of this nature. Um, well, separately, uh, it had only been 25 years since we started NCPS, and already the details that we have just heard in their recounting a few minutes ago, um, the details uh, of how the, this institution had trans transitioned to becoming, uh, I should add, unabashedly, one of India's premier biological research institutes, the details have already become uh, foggy, at least in my mind. Um, so I decided that you know we we, sh we must try and build something uh, like an archive, not not only for recalling, but but for many other things that uh, Venkat has just has just indicated. Um, but this would not have happened, um, at least in terms of concept and and in terms of our being able to take uh, take these ideas forward, uh, had we not hosted um, somebody who is an archival rat, Janaki Nair. Um, right at in the beginnings of when we started uh, uh, moving to this campus, Sani Kinar came and spent about a year here. She's a historian who's at JNU right now, and she spent a year here, and she was forever uh, ferreting around archives in, in Mysore and coming and telling us stories about what we could discover. She, uh, and then Indra Chaudhary, who now runs the public archives uh, program at, at uh, Shristi, um, she came here right after Janaki Nair, and you know, together there, I, I, I would say, you know, lit the spark of us beginning to think about an archive. I mean, which perhaps, uh, but you know, that spark was lit then, perhaps, and when we celebrated 25 years, I, I think it, it burst into a flame. Um, <clears throat> but none of this 
uh, would have happened um, had Venkat, uh, on one of his uh, various visits to Bangalore, decided to come and see us, because we had we had put out a call through Indra that uh, we needed uh, to build this archive. Um, and and then uh, he um, approached us, I think for, for his own um, selfish motives, if I may add, that he wanted to build a digital archive uh, here, a project that he was trying to pull together. And uh, somehow I convinced him to to, to uh, maybe fooled him in thinking that if he helped us build our archive, we would be able to build what he, what he wanted to do. Uh, I, 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 I must say, uh, I don't know who's fooling whom, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, here, but we, have, uh, we have the archives at NCBS. Um, and, uh, and it, as uh, Venkat just so eloquently uh, indicated, uh, it aims to be a collecting space for institutional records and history of contemporary biology in India. Um, it's guided, I'd argue, uh, by a simple vision uh, that is a space which will help us enable multiple and diverse stories, Sp a space where we can put together, um, uh, put together stories about things uh, from the past. Um, I, when, when we say contemporary, um, uh, that can also stretch. So, uh, so I'm hoping that you know, we'd have a place where we can bring in a discussion around uh, biology and biologists and, and, and the sciences that have contributed to the study of biology uh, in, in this country. Uh, and, <clears throat> and that we will work uh, also as a consortium, as an interconnected uh, set network of archives that uh, we hope will create a new way of looking at uh, archival um, engagement uh, in the future, bringing in historians, journalists, scientific researchers, and the general public. Um, the idea about <clears throat> embedding uh, this uh, uh, material from scientific archives and research in archival re repositories is also a pedagogical one, and I hope we will also engage in some pedagogy around uh, uh, the archive. Uh, the archive at NCBS already has an active internship, as, uh, as um, uh, Venkat just mentioned, uh, and it will open with a, uh, a set of collections. I, I know that uh, the, the, cu the curators uh, that uh, Venkat has been working with are, are also here, and they have organized a, uh, one of the first attempts at what, what we hope our archive will do, which is to bring uh, different views to the material that's within the archive. Uh, so that we can take uh, a somewhat uh, lateral glance at what, at, at what these stories from history tell. Uh, so without any further ado, let me also uh, invite uh, Sanjeev, who is another archive rat. He has um, explored many, many archives, and I'm not even going to want to name, name any of them. Um, I, I just want to say, uh, I, you know, a deep and heartfelt thanks to Deba. I don't know if Deba is here, um, but ah, yeah, uh, and uh, and of course to uh, you know everyone from Abed's uh, family that that uh, could not be here today. But we really deeply grateful for uh, being the first contributors to to this archive and also uh, in envisioning it's it's happening. Thank you. And take you through some of our work on tracking the history of medicine in South Asia with some kind of reference to psychiatry, but uh, not always so. So one of the first things we find is this, I found, was, uh, uh, thanks again to NCBS, this was an invitation from Trinity College Dublin to come and spend a week there uh, looking at their archives. And this is a book which is dated, if you can read that, it is Khulistane Hukma, an epitome of medicine by Hakim Hamed, a resident of the Balfour in the region of Shah, in the time of Shah Jahan. So actually read a medical textbook that has been written at the time of Shah Jahan is unique in itself. It's a spectacular book, leather bound, painted with gold, beautiful calligraphy. But what's interesting is there's a miniature painting which represents a womb in the middle of the body. The, the nerves are almost intact and you have a four chambered heart. So it is sometime after Vesalius and sometime before Harvey that this has been painted. 
And the fact that, that advances in dissection in Europe were already becoming extant in India by the time of Shah Jahan is quite interesting. So the fact that, and these of course nerves are very, very intact and they show the autonomic nervous system and the magnetic ganglia and the autonomic nervous system. So not only is there a central nervous system, there's also autonomic nervous system already identified at that point in time. So this itself was quite fascinating. There is, then we coming across to more uh, contemporary things. There's a letter by Tipu Sultan published in the Times of London, from way back in 1719, and that in matters of great importance, the secrets of the heart, it's very flowery Persian, I presume they translated it, cannot be known by but the verbal communication of personal consequence. Peace may take place between us and the happiness and quietude of mankind be established. So uh, this is Tipu writing to uh, the people in London, of course that doesn't happen. And what happens is the siege of Bangalore of 1793, the British have no intention of listening to uh, Tipu Sultan's polite writings. And this is a beautiful map. These little lines are the places where the cannons to siege uh, Bangalore were laid. One of these cannons was found recently when they were digging for the metro near the, near the old city. And one of the cannons was found now in 70, from 1793. So it's a fascinating thing. But what's important is David Markham, who's a soldier in this, in this whole battle, and who is wounded very grievously, and his right ear in the wound was very severe. And he, and uh, he is related to Sir Clement Markham, who is then credited with bringing the uh, quinine tree all the way from South America to Bangalore, and growing it in Narbonne and Uti. And that's how the, the whole quinine revolution of Indian medicine starts, and the British are then able to Central India, but uh, particulars of a capture of Bangalore and Captain Markham is shot in the neck and he ultimately gets killed in Afghanistan while he's in negotiating with somebody in Afghanistan. Coming, uh, remaining in southern India, so this is the first time that we have the idea of a, of a hospital under traditional or old Indian, uh, you know, feudal uh, religious divides. Uh, the idea of a public space where everybody could go for treatment was unthinkable. You had your own caste religious group physicians who tended to you at home because public spaces were also defined by your caste origins. And the hospitals of the European kind were absolutely unimaginable in the, at least in medieval India. So I did uh, proposals. So this is affording security against the perpetration of those acts of violence and being sensible ourselves of the salutary consequences that would benefit from such an establishment. We, start, we should start a mental hospital in 1794, which would be specifically for the reception of the native poor. So this, idea, this preoccupation with the native poor is again a, unique, a new concept in the, in the, in the, as a factor of statehood, because before that it's only the uh, merchant class, the banyas and the, and the merchants who would run hospitals, the kings very seldom ran hospitals, they were too busy fighting. And then we come to the specific plans of Bangalore. So after all these things in Mysore and uh, Bangalore, the British army moves after 1809 when the, the epidemic of malaria and Sriranga Patna becomes uh, very bad. So this is the containment of Bangalore as it was established. So this is what is now Coven Road and this is MG Road and this is the various lakes. And this is the building that are just about to be demolished were the containment barracks. And including that was the hospitals it was surrounded by lakes and water bodies. The highest point in the center of the city was given to European troops and hospitals, which is approximately this whole area. And that was the old also tank. And this is a map made sometime in 1809 by one of the army officers. Why was it important? Because Mysore was a very big cantonment. It had more than 15,000 soldiers. It had uh, the largest single physical space of, uh, of the British Army uh, for till the Second World War, and Second World War was the largest base east of the Suez for the Allied effort. So it was always a big uh, area. Of course, by then, there were other asides. So that is a typical European Englishman in India. He's drunk, he's pot-bellied, and he's got many, multiple empty bottles lying around him. So the fate of the Englishman in India was always very chaotic. And these are all the illnesses that they had. These are records of the hospital at Bangalore in 19, uh, 1829 to 18, 1938, 10 years data. Uh, of course, you have lots of apoplexies and fevers and various kinds of fevers. But of particular interest to a psychiatrist is delirium tremens, too much drinking, which is, affects almost 10% of the British, but hardly anybody of the Indians, Indian, so they drink, obviously drink more than us. There is insanity, which is quite lethal. It, it affects about 100 people, and about 20 of them die. 
and syphilis. Eight, three, four thousand of them have syphilis in the 10 years. So Bangalore is famous for its debauched and bohemian lifestyle, so that <laughs> accounts for that. <laughs> so drinking and everything else. It works the other way also. So this is a record I found in the archives in, in Switzerland, in uh, Scotland. This is, India. this is a British uh, Scottish soldier who is admitted there, Richard Charteris, who writes a play for production in the, as part of the occupational therapy in, uh, in, the, in the Crichton Hospital, Crichton or Crichton, whichever you pronounce it, and it describes the play in three languages, English, Devanagari, and Persian. Turns out he's been a soldier in India, and that time the British had to pass an exam in Persian, just like you all have to pass ILTS, that time they had it in reverse. So this man was very proud of his knowledge of Persian, and, was, and it was assumed that speaking Persian was superior to merely speaking English, just like we speak in English as superior to being our native languages. So this idea, and he comes up with this symptom whenever he's manic, that by his knowledge of Hindustani and Parsi, that's per, the Persian and other departments, quarrels with the brother of his dissipation may, of course, have been a cause for his illness, as we heard, they used to drink a bit much. Of specific interest is a very elaborate diary, which is a wonderful manuscript to hold and process. This is an account by Dr. Charles Irving Smith, who worked as a, who worked as a doctor here from 1833 to, from 1831 almost till 1881, father and son, for 50 years. He was born, his father was Lieutenant Smith, who had been a part of the soldiers which broke into Seringapatnam. He was born in Mysore, sent off to England to study, came back to work here as a doctor and lived here all his life. He kept an enormous book, a commonplace book, where he noted as many patients as he could. So it's a very fat manuscript. And there he writes Mania. In 1938, with the sanction of Mania, and the, this is a very detailed account. In the sanction of the commissioner, which is Mark Kaban, I opened a ward for insane patients, and following year one for females, and treated 20, 30 patients of all castes and ages, the forms of Mania most common, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. One patient became suspicious of a native official and shot dead a native to force attention on himself. In other words, eccentric to the point of madness and became acutely disturbed and was obliged to put him in a straight jacket. By this time, his notes reveal that he is already reading the works of Esquirol, who published, who reformed Sir in 1809. He is well versed with the rules of uh, Morsley Hospital, so he has already been trained in England as how to run mental hospitals. What's interesting is that he's also a, an economist. I mean, as doctors were supposed to do everything, he's also got elaborate accounts of the rain and the weather and the trees of Bangalore, how Bangalore is denuded of its trees and will soon become a desert, so things don't change too much, how Kurd is being, uh, being flattened, but this is the more important part, that the surplus revenue of Mysore had increased from 55 lakhs a year to 80 lakhs in 1849, more than 5.5 lakh pounds now worth 1.2 billion pounds in revenue per year was being extracted from Mysore. At Cornwallis, when he lost Washington and won Bangalore, assured the British that the loss of Mysore more than compensated for whatever American colonies they had lost. So Mysore Kingdom was more particularly happy with the fact that increase in revenue has been accomplished without a single farmer being bankrupt or having to sell his lands, more than our current governments can say. But the Peta Hospital ultimately gets shut down which is where he worked in. It's a hospital, it's a, a place called Hospital for Peons and Paupers. By which time the mental hospital has been set up, and these are the records that we have from early 19th century, 19, 1856 to 58 and 1887, very careful record of all the names of doctors being admitted, of patients being admitted and what happened to them. So it's fairly elaborate. And of course in 1881, the, the British have to hand over the Mysore King back to the kings because they've taken it over on so-called whenever there was, uh, for a 50-year period, 1831 to 1881. And at that point, they leave behind, and this is in the state archives, Karnataka State Government Archives. And this is a very elaborate eight-page document. What will be the future of medicine and science in Bangalore? Now that it's going back to a native kingdom. A larger mental hospital as the population of Bangalore was expected to increase from one lakh at that point of time to considerably more now, 7.5 million. So, the future medical arrangements of Mysore must partake of a European character because there is no native system to fall back upon. And despite suggestion, no changes have been made to rectify that. Now the British ruled uh, at that point of time, the, Calc uh, the Bengal, Madras and the Bombay presidency and medical colleges had been set up in each one of them and later one in Lahore. So the four presidency towns had medical colleges and they would not allow any native kingdom to set up a med medical college. And the Mysore Kingdom insisted for a long time 
that they would be, uh, they would like to do that, but that was not done. And this necessitated that by 1880, when the British were giving up, the principal charges of the medical service would be Bowring Hospital, Lunatic Asylum, and the medical stores, and all the present staff needs to be from Madras, because that's the nearest place they have a medical college. And this then changes the very demographics of Bangalore, because a large number of Tamil Western educated intelligence are moving. So all the Mudalias, or if you see the notes, they're all by various Mudalias and Armagams, and uh, the entire hospitals are run by that. And these are then medical uh, Madras officers are then uh, trained, uh, then sent here. Of course, some things don't change at all. There's a letter of 1889, again from the uh, Karnataka archives, from British doctor attached to the Kingdom of Mysore, who's being recalled to active service in Burma, Afghanistan, but a war with Russia, with operations in, in Afghanistan would be another thing, and it's still going on, to the best of my knowledge. <laughs> The Mysore Kingdom also starts appointing British doctors into its own medical service. And this is a very interesting uh, comment he has on psychiatrists. As a rule, persons that have tried and failed other appointments seek service in the lunatic asylum, people like me. More than 50% have scorned after a few months, and I'm still staying. Experienced staff is necessary to ensure safety, etc., etc. Uh, and why uh, the care of mental patients is so important. What he also recommends is that of the local staff he has, he sends them to England for training, and also the suggestion he set up an Indian Association for Advancement of Science. So this is the first time we think of an Indian Association for Science being set up, and it's, no, uh, it's uh, obvious that the, when it is set up, it is set up in Bangalore, with the, with the famous talk by Mirza Ismail and others on setting up the Indian National Science Academy here, or is it Science Academy? Indian Academy of Sciences. So that's the earliest reference we find to that ever. Of course, by then, modern is coming up. The suggestion for revision of the lunatic asylum increased in annual expense by 1,000 rupees, by better salaries, retrenchments have to be done, and recommendations for increasing pay. And it's not possible to, to have that increment of 1,000 rupees a year. Nimhans currently runs around 400 crores per year, approximately. So we currently spent 400 crores a year, and at that point of time, a 1,000 rupee increase was not to be ten, uh, understood. There are various things called a spoon diet and a normal diet, and these are very interesting. The spoon diet, we haven't been able to figure out, is basically patients who are not eating anything else, and they have to be fed by a spoon. So great attention is paid. They have to have milk, they have to have ganji and arrowroot. But what's interesting is the various kinds of diets. There is a non vegan there's a European diet, there's an Indian diet, and there's an Indian vegetarian diet. So there are three different kinds of diets, because by the middle of the, by the early part of the 20th century, the Indian caste system starts reasserting itself, and separate cooks have to be there for Europeans, Indian Brahmins, Lingayats, and others. So there's a whole different uh, thing of that. This is Armuga Mudalia's report of 1916, uh, 215 cases, 85 new cases, 78 discharged, so many are cured, and uh, what's interesting is, that large number of patients in India actually improve. Although there's no known treatment, they just stay there for a few weeks and they get better. And asylum visitors inspected nine times in the year. We have not had an inspection in the last five years at this point in time. And of course, attention being paid to cleanliness. And patients are made to work and their work output is 10,000 rupees. And this is all the details of their expenses, of the mortality rates, which they say are gradually improving. This is also the time when you had the great influenza epidemic. And Bangalore was, fit, was hit particularly hard. And there were a large number of deaths because of, the, uh, epi uh, because of that. But by the early 1920s, it was decided all over the world, and especially the British Empire, that lunatic asylum is not a good name to have for hospitals, and we should change it to a mental hospital. So change of name is discussed on 27 September 1926, forwarded by Sir Mirza on 28 September 1926. On 2nd October, Krishna Raja Odia signs it out. Five days. Of the, for the file to, from beginning to end of change of a name of a hospital. I don't think in Achet and things work so fast. <laughs> but it's interesting that this whole thing starts in England, goes to South Africa by 1922-23, and comes all over India by 1924, 25, 26. All the hospitals in India are systematically changed. And this is supposed to be a, a way to reduce stigma, which it, it was in some way, but after that it uh, required a kind of change of orientation. Of course, the, uh, the buildings continue to deteriorate. For those of you who are new to Bangalore, uh, the mental hospital was at the, uh, where the Majestic Cinema is. 
the whole the state bank of mysore headquarters is where the mental hospital building still stands and the welter of buildings was a lawn for the mental hospital it was sold for the price of 22 lakhs the entire property from the mysore bank circle right down to the uh, bus stand was sold for 22 lakhs and that was used to build the new campus so the previous building is more like a chhatram it has deteriorated and therefore he's uh, uh, dr narona is deputed to england to do his dpm and earn at an extra expense of 25 pounds for his kit and other expenses so at the end of the first world war the british realized that uh, everybody who's anybody in psychiatry or neurology has to be trained in germany and after fighting a war for four years you really don't want to spend your, send your best students to the enemy so they have to set up their own institute and who better to ask for money to the empire so the, all the doctors of empire have to be sent to england with their own cost 25 pounds is not trivial at the, in those days so all the doctors are sent there and dr rona is sent there he's a doctor in the in the medical service and he writes he comes back and starts writing his very elaborate reports and uh, how many new admissions there are and very detailed accounts of his and this is as he's setting off to england this is dr narona in the center he's a graduate of the mysore of the madras medical college and uh, we uh, his family has been kind enough to donate some very interesting letters his father comes here as a munshi to cunningham of cunningham road so the father has worked with cunningham he has he himself is born in bangalore uh, the senior uh, narona has we got a copy of his letter of application to get married in bangalore so he asked for 8 months of leave 2 months to walk there 2 months for the wedding and 2 months to walk back so and it's all gets sanctioned so and but his writing is so beautifully recursive so by 1855 or whatever cunningham took takes over the the writing and the record keeping is so accurate that there's an actual account of uh, everything that goes on frank uh, narona's full name is francis xavier cunningham narona so i'm still not able to figure out whether he's been named cunningham by his parents in gratitude to cunningham of cunningham road whose brother is the major botanist scientist of india so this is uh, this is the old building and by the time he's trained in england you see a complete change in the way records are maintained we now follow the british system of or the rather the universal system of both british american and all the records so you have very uh, elaborate forms uh, you know medical condition forms of insanity uh, personal history habits temperament symptoms family history physical condition much like what we would do a work up today all this is centralized by the institute of psychiatry in london as a copy of the institute of psychiatry in munich the munich kreplin uh, uh, asylum institute of psychiatry in munich uh, in 1918 and the british use almost exactly the same curriculum and forms and they translate that into english and then it gets transported all over the empire and you can see that narona's accounts are epitome of of uh, in the field at least german phenomenological teaching this is all these words are derived from uh, phenomenology morbidly elated exalted in ideas incoherent in speech and violent without provocation the indian patient says he was sleeping when the devil entered him and he does not know anything more so the disparity between the european notion of madness and the indian notion of madness is quite apparent and this goes on about bangalore of course is getting more and more civilized cannabis they need to regulate because too much cannabis is being sold the quantity less than rupees 2 produces no harmful effects but higher causes higher doses cause stupefaction and temporary insanity so as long as you stay within 2 year 2 rupees it is enough several several thousand mounds are to be produced and sold in the city of bangalore and of course by that time the british empire is being subverted by the evil germans who have just made synthetic cocaine and they're dumping cocaine into all of empire so this is annual license of selling cocaine being increased from rupees to 10 instead of rupees 6 this is a kind of imperial strategy because the british insisted on selling opium to the chinese the germans said well, then you have to give us permission to sell cocaine and that's how it starts the rules for drinking were very clear and these are very elaborate rules this is all from the karnataka state archives If whoever has a bar uh, runs a bar should have a place to sit the interior should be visible to all from the outside to preserve transparency women connected in any way to soldiers are not to be served at all so this is very very important to preserve uh, the uh, whatever decorum and never to be sold on loan or advance i think many students would have something to say about that but refreshment room licenses all come in 
uh, these are much of the same. So very, very elaborate uh, rules, regulations. And then we come to how a new mental hospital is to be planned in Mysore, request a reconsideration of a new hospital, needs close collaboration with local hospitals, as what Naruna <coughs> says to the senior surgeon. Now this is happening because Mysore is officially the capital and Bangalore is just a town, a cantonment <coughs> at that. But Bangalore is also where they have the Victoria Hospital and the Waring Hospital. And Naruna suggests that it should be built here. And large medical centers in Bangalore and a suitable site can be found for the purpose between Lalbag and Baswangudi. Baswangudi they are famous, they are familiar with because when the cholera epidemics happened in the, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Patients from all the hospitals moved to Basangodi, which was otherwise considered a hill station. It had the most salubrious air of the whole of Bangalore. And of course, once it went away, people who knew how things go took that over as real estate to live in, and the patients were sent back to the asylums. But this area between Lalbag and Basangodi were considered a good place, and away from the main centers of population will still be within easy reach of the medical establishment. For those of you who've been to the other end of Bangalore, you realize that you have to cross something called Double Road. How many have been through Double Road? Oh, lots of you. It was a lake. Okay, so the high point of the Bangalore Club or the residency was on one side, there was a lake, and then there was the hills of Lalbagh, and the little valley, and then on the other hill was the city of Bangalore, with Tipu's fort. And the, the Nimhans Hill was next, was a continuation of the hill of uh, Lalbagh. And that was the second highest hill in Bangalore, the highest hill having already been given up to the Indian Institute of Science, the second highest hill was chosen the highest point of the city of Bangalore was chosen for this. The building should have a superintendent office on the first floor so the entire hospital can be seen, separate observation wards, etc., 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 etc. And the center of attraction for all the, for the patients and something that will make life worth living for them. So that was for 250 beds. This is uh, the hospital as it was being inaugurated. This is a foundation stone being laid by the Maharaj of Mysore and in the gym, to the uh, uh, right of him you can see a vague cap, that is Sir Mirza Ismail. This was the first public building to be set up and developed by entirely an Indian company. All large construction projects were invariably done by the British. But Mirza Ismail and the Mysore Kingdom are very clear that we have the technology and the services to do this. New forms of architectural material had to be built, trusses had to be built, girders had to be built, and all this was done in-house in, in Mysore Kingdom. So the firm itself had Ramaswamy, Janadan Iyengal, and K. Thirumalachar. All of them were civil engineering graduates. So unlike the building on MG Road, there is no European architect. There is no European contractor. It was a, one of the first large public buildings in the kingdom, and perhaps in India, of this scale to be built and uh, done entirely by, uh, by Indian expertise. Of course, that's what was on the outside. On the inside, things were, were also doing very remarkably um, modern or in that period of time. So this is a Yucatan table. How many of you have seen Cuckoo's Nest or whatever? Some of you. So you remember the Yucatan? So these are the clamps to hold the head in place. And then you just drill through and make a hole. And these are Yucatan notes from the 1930s. Uh, Bangalore has the dubious distinction of being the first place outside of Europe to do Yucatanese. And they did almost a thousand of them in Bangalore alone. And you've also tried insulin coma, with, by which you make your blood glucose drop by giving you large amounts of insulin. Unfortunately, insulin was very expensive, so we have letters in the institute, people writing to Banting and Best to get some insulin free from them. So it was all uh, quite collegial in that sense. Of course, all over India, there was this big concern that insanity is increasing and uh, the lunatic's life, the census, of course, says the lunatic's life is not a happy one, but a million lunatics at large as by Lodgepatch, who was trying to reform psychiatry in northern India, um, was quite interesting because he found that it was very, very difficult to do anything um, in Lahore. As, as he says, the third part of this book, which many of, of you in the administration really have realized, is traces the movements of a cog in a government gearbox, an insubordinate cog, which somehow caused the machine to go forward when it was actually set to remain in reverse. In the middle of this is something called the Bhore Committee, which only those who get involved in health policy have to read incessantly. These are international advisors to the Bhore Committee, which includes everybody who's anybody in the world. Henry Sigeris from Johns Hopkins, Comston from Australia, who's head of the healthcare. John Ryle, who is uh, the inventor of the Ryle's tube, intragastric tube, intra tubes, and the first professor of social medicine at Oxford. Dalrymple Champneys, who's the uh, doctor to the royal household. Janet Vaughan, 
who is remembered for many things. But anybody know why blood is, when you donate blood or receive blood is in pints? Janet Vaughan was in charge of, uh, was in charge of transfusion during the Second World War. And she commanded a large number of pubs to store and dispense blood. <laughs> so everything is sterilized. You have large cans. Everything is, you can pump it out. So everything is to be pumped out in pints. Simple enough. <laughs> so that one was a, she was also the first lady principal of Newnham. And as he used to say, I'm very proud of having a prime minister as my student. And Gandhi studied there and was a close friend of hers throughout her life. So it's a very in interesting kind of connections of Somerville, sorry, Somerville, Somerville. And, uh, but what was even more interesting is that uh, Janet Vaughan had been educated personally at home by a person many of you would be familiar with called JBS Haldane. She had never gone to school. And she went straight from being home tutored to medical college and becoming head of transfusion and becoming head of Somerville. So, and she and Henry and uh, I were a member of the Socialist Medical Union, who was then with the Fabian Society trying to develop the ideas for an NHS in England. And these ideas they hoped would be transferred to India. So they went to a town called, which some of you may recognize, called Sin Singur, where the Tata problem happened, which had the first, India's first cooperative health movement. So it, it, some things have a long history. Of course, in the middle of all this, you have meetings in Calcutta in, uh, on 12th August to discuss the psychological issues following communal violence, which have just started, because they feel that present conflicts and those in prospect have the possibility of human and cultural destruction. It is headed by, by the Friends Ambulance, it is being called by the Friends Ambulance, which has it in its members, Richard Simmons, Hollis Alexander, and Agatha Harrison, who are good friends. But here in the detail, we also have NRM Sastri, who is the head of psychology at the Indian Institute of Science. Current, current faculty in the Institute of Science do not even recall there being a humanities department at the Indian Institute of Science. Okay, so the fact that somebody has come in all the way from Bangalore and he wants to understand the Oedipal complex issues of Indians which are driving them to this violence. He wants to suggest what can be a psychoanalytical view, response to this whole violence. And this, this is a very large document, six or seven pages long. And they, they are trying to figure out what is wrong with the psychology of Indians to be doing this violence. Of course, Alexander, the French ambulance gets the Nobel Peace Prize in 1950, but that's a different issue. Then, of course, you have this other issue of how to improve medical uh, education in Mysore, especially in Nimhans. And Major Bhatia, who has a long history going back to the First World War as a medical student in England, and then sets up various institutions in India, and his archives are now at the St. John's Hospital, because he's got collections of everything that he ever worked with. And eight or 10 boxes are lying unopened in the National Archives in Delhi. But Bhatia is very, very instrumental because he guided the development of the Ornia Institute. He was in personal correspondence with people like, like Hill, uh, of the Hodgkin Hill and Huxley fame. So he was a very influential physiologist and biologist who taught in Bangalore, Bombay, and uh, retired in Bangalore. But he suggests that this is what should happen. This is a view shared by Mayor Gross and various other people who came here as uh, as, uh, as professors in the 1950s, and all of them had been expatriate Jews from Nazis who had fled to England, become friends with Govind Swami and the others who set up the institute, and come to India to write their textbooks. Now, what is it that we see in our, in our records, in the Nimhan's archives that we have created? This is a 30-year-old gentleman, married, working in a beauty factory from Chittagong, all the way. My, how he lands up in Bangalore, we are absolutely obscure. He has all these symptoms. He says that I know English, French, Kannada, Tamil, Bengali, Hindi, and Urdu. And why does he know all that? Because he has been in Chittagong and was working in a steamer, working from Chittagong to Vietnam, which is where he learns French. And then he ends up in a mental hospital here, basically because he's smoking too much ganja. And, he's, uh, and he just does not want to give smoking ganja because he says with ganja I can speak 10 languages and otherwise I, I can't. So <laughs> good enough reason. Why, why is all this of concern? Because we are also interested in what happened with the partition, and this is a note from uh, Mountbatten's diaries. First, he kept a detailed note from the time he took over to the time he left. So he mentions one of the few institutions will not be partitioned in the Punjab Mental Hospital, it will continue to be shared, etc., etc. Some Hindu inmates of the asylum has protested against being left in Pakistan. They have been assured that their fears are imaginary. The imaginary word is mine. 
obviously that does not happen because many of us would have read Toba Tek Singh and you know that what, is, what appears to be a farcical story is actually reality. Because what happens is this. This is letters from the Badab Hospital dated 22-11-1950 that uh, the, uh, what is a time has been fixed for the probable date for the exchange of Muslim mental patients who are present under treatment in the various mental hospitals in India with non-Muslim patients in Punjab Mental Hospital. So you're actually changing patients around as if you're exchanging tables and furniture. The patients are not being asked, their families are not being asked, some bureaucrat is sitting somewhere in Delhi and making lists who goes where. And of course the Nagpur Hospital says I have to state that no transfer uh, are, are pending. So we have no idea how many people were transferred, how was it, was, was these discussed by weight on weight, that same number of patients have to go on either side, just like they did to the chairs and tables, but we have no idea as to how all this happened. So over the just 200 years, you can see that medicine or the care of the mental ill moves from being a bureaucratic diktat from the East India Company to set up hospitals for the poor, gets transitioned into the kingdom of Mysore, which is setting up its own hospitals. They then transition to having a westernized medical system. They then send their doctors to England to train in medicine. They come back and change things and design new things. And the science and the process of, of psychiatry gets changed. Neurosurgery gets introduced well before we knew any neuroanatomy or neuro neurophysiology. So you, you have a kind of openness to, in a, kind, in a sense, experimentation, which is quite unique. And how this then guided the growth of science. Now, uh, I was speaking to Professor Rodam Narasimha last year, and his father worked with the founders of Nemhans, the Govind Swami, to try and develop indigenous EG amplifiers. In 1950s, they knew. So one of the first departments set up in Nemhans was the Department of Biophysics in 1954. Why biophysics? Because there was a technology blockage after independence. You could not import sensitive equipment like valves and amplifiers. And the doctors wanted to record EGs. So they had to synthesize, they had to make their own EG machines from scratch. They had to make their own ECD machines from scratch. So if they imported it, it was 2,000 pounds. It was manufactured in Bangalore and sold for 300 rupees. So the kind of cost differences between Western technology, local and there were pretty high. So these kinds of things can put you in a, put in a nutshell how different kinds of diseases, how different kinds of processes go on. It works in both directions. For example, that record of the insane patient I showed you from uh, Charles Irving Smith, the man who suddenly went insane, the European who suddenly went insane. Now being a very uh, conscientious doctor, he does an autopsy and he examines the brain. And he says that there are little pebble-like things around nodules which are hanging from the fox cerebri by the thin stalk. And this, because he's serving in Bangalore and has no connection with the rest of the world, is probably the world's first case of cysticercosis being described. Cysticercosis is a disease is defined only 40 years later. So many of the doctor's notes are actually an indication of how infective disease, how pathologies, how processes were identified. And there are very, very interesting, very quick parallels. For example, based upon some of that, there's a rule in the Bangalore cantonment that no pork will be eaten unless it has been cooked by the, by the mess cook. Because they already know, even before they know cysticercosis, that somehow it is coming in from that. Of course, there's a much more interesting thing when Mark Cubbon issues a letter saying that no beer is to be brewed or consumed by the soldiers outside that cantonment without his personal stamp on it. So he has to stamp every bottle of beer. But that's a different thing entirely. So they make an effort to control the health statistics, the, the conditions of the city, the science of the city, and it shows a lot of interesting inter intersects with the way we think of medicine, disease, empire, and knowledge. So all of this work, we hope, uh, is being done with my colleagues at Nimhans, but we have an archive of almost a similar amount, 50 to 80,000 uh, objects, independent of the case notes. We have around 6,000 case notes from <laughs> Bangalore. We have around 5,000 case notes from Tezpur. We have added about 3,000 case notes from Dharwad, and we are in the process of identifying case notes from Nagpur. Now, the mentally ill are the, definitely the most marginalized of the marginalized. So if you really want to study subaltern history, that is where to start. Because it is really the ultimate outcast records that, of course, they are not in their own records, but there are snippets of it. For example, some years ago, we 
we found an old safe in the Nimhans, in the hospital, and we had to break it open. And it, it had somebody's jaws cross from the First World War. The patient had been admitted there, probably died there, but his First World War cross, which he had won for valor, was left in our safes. There are tons of Mangal Sutras. There are tons of, there are several letters written by patients, from patients. There are bills for expensive medication from Berlin, from Toronto, like I said, from Bryston Taylor. So you get lots of communication as to how science and everything progress. And we look forward to this interconnected digital library of science, which I think would be a fascinating idea to see how science and technology worked in Mysore across the two ends of the city, between the so-called pure science institutes at this end and all the medical hospitals of the state at the other end. Uh, that's Victoria Hospital, Bowring, and uh, the Nimahans and St. John's and the cancer hospitals and all these things. So, I mean, it, it is also important for the planning of the city because we keep talking about many cities. And the hillock of, of Lalbagh was designed by Wilson, who was, a, who was the health secretary at that point of time, to be an area of rest and recuperation for the whole of the poorest of the, of the people of Bangalore, of Mysore. So the best point in the city was reserved for the poorest as a statement of intent. And that is very interesting because the, the mental hospital, the Boston, the TB hospital, the home for the rescued women were all set up in that area, surrounded by a garden, which was supposed to be Wilson's garden. Of course, you know, if you, those of you again have gone there, know Wilson's garden is a bit of a mess these days. So thank you for your, for your attention and thanks. We could probably take a couple of very, very quick questions if anybody has. Uh, but it has to be super quick, and I, you know I'm a tyrant, so I'm going to, you know. I just got a very quick question. You mentioned the uh, Friends Ambulance. Um, yes. Um, can, can you tell me more about what the Friends involvement was? Well, the Friends Ambulance was an organization uh, looking, uh, initially providing help to the war wounded in the First World War and the Second World War. But they, right from the end of the Second World War, they started their actions in India. And it was run by the Quakers. And uh, they set up a very large uh, establishment. And uh, for various reasons, they were very good friends of Mahatma Gandhi, historical reasons. So whenever Mahatma Gandhi would go to London, he would stay in the friend's house. And uh, most of his public lectures in London were delivered at the friend's house, uh, which conveniently is next to the Welcome Library. So, <laughs> so, uh, so there's a wealth of archival detail about the activities of these groups. And Richard Simmons and Horace Alexander and Angela Harrison have left careful notes about their eyewitness accounts of the partition. And that became an invaluable resource for us to when we were trying to track down the events of the partition because very few Indian notes are available for that point of time. So uh, m much of these archives are available and uh, so that, that's where it comes in. But that it's, uh, I think there are a number of books on it on the, on the link between Quakers and Mahatma Gandhi itself is a is a matter of some uh, historical interest. Um, thank you so much, Sanjeev. This is fantastic. Thank you.